Several weeks ago, a new series about the 13 principles of our faith. We've already covered the first uh, three, actually the first two. We've done a third lecture about bitachon, uh, about trusting God. And today we're going to be doing the third principle. The third principle, as the Rambam uh, states it, is that we believe that I believe with perfect faith that God does not have a body. Physical concepts do not apply to him. There is nothing whatsoever that resembles him at all. But before we go into the principle, I'd like to just give a brief uh, but important introduction to tonight's topic because it touches a little bit on the Kabbalah. There's tremendous confusion in the world that always has been in the attempt to understand God. What is it? What is he? Hopefully you did not study Greek mythology, but in case you did stumble on it, you would have noticed the many, many gods' depictions of all sorts of male and female entities. <coughs> and the same thing with Hinduism and various other civilizations who have worshipped the many deities that they claimed exist, many powers out there. And as you can imagine, there's, there is a great deal of confusion out there. There's no clarity. It doesn't mean that one cannot attain clarity. Avraham Avinu did so. So one can attain clarity as to this very important fact that there's only one and not more. But nevertheless, you will soon see why there was a great deal of confusion that led people to believe all kinds of beliefs. What is this divine being all about? What is this power that exists out there? The fact that they believed in something other than themselves is good too. They obviously admit that there's a divine power, there's something greater than all of us, there's something that brought us into our existence, there's someone there's something that created this world. We don't fully comprehend it. That's obvious too. But because of the great confusion in trying to understand this entity that they cannot see, even though they can observe a little bit of what he does, right? this led to all sorts of beliefs and all sorts of religions. Part of the confusion stems from the very simple fact there, there, besides the physical world that we observe, that we see and sense, there is something spiritual in this world. This is something the scientists do not admit as yet. Even though they've come to the conclusion that the other, other than the physical powers or forces at work, there is some sort of energy that is keeping everything together. There is something that they cannot observe with the naked eye, or, if, or I should say they cannot even observe it under the microscope. There's something out there that they cannot see. At least some of them are saying that. And that is what we call koach haruchani, that there's something spiritual out there that is obviously not observable to the physical eye. And the reason why it's not observable is because the human being, for the most part, is physical. So therefore, what he sees is the physical world around him. He does not see the spiritual. With our eyes, we cannot see ghosts, not, at least not most of the time. Occasionally, people will see a ghost, will see a spirit. But most of the time, the physical body cannot see all sorts of things that do exist around us. When can we see things that are incredible? Anybody know? When can you see incredible things? When? When we think. No? When davening? When you're in the middle of davening, you're praying? Well, you, uh, Hopefully you're concentrating on your prayer. You can feel, like, you can feel the shina. Oh, that's, that's a very good point. You can feel something, right. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that a little but bit. But when you are sick, right? you are very, I feel that you are so sister. You're hallucinating, yeah. So you're getting close. The imagination is very powerful. The imagination can see a lot of things that do not exist. But then there is something that does exist that you can see, and that is when you are dreaming. When you are dreaming, you're able to see those individuals who have left this world. You will see them the way they appear to you. And sometimes you may even see them when they were a lot younger than they really were when they left this world. But at least you will recognize them. You will be able to identify 
those individuals that you cannot physically see anymore. So in a dream. Oh, besides a dream, I'll talk a little bit about that later too, you can see certain things right before you leave this world yourself. You know, there was the individual, even though he cannot see spiritual entities, spiritual beings, there are times he can see them. What about animals? Animals somehow have this sense that we don't have. They can sense earthquakes coming. They can see all kinds of demons that we don't see. Thank God we don't see them. Imagine if we would see all the demons walking around us or flying around us. We'd go crazy. But animals can see, and that is why animals sometimes bark and sometimes get scared, because they see, they observe certain things that we cannot. And why is that? What's the difference between the human being and the animal? The essence of the human being, the real human being, is his neshama, is his soul. So when you place a soul within a physical body, the physical body acts as a barrier, as a curtain. So even though the soul is looking through the, the eyes, the eyes are, are made out of flesh. These are not the eyes of the soul. So the, the soul can no longer see that which it can really see once it leaves this world. The physical body acts as a barrier, various layers that prevent him from seeing that which is spiritual. An animal that does not have a soul, an animal that is basically just a living spirit, right, has no curtains, has not, no barriers, and basically sees whatever it was allowed to see without any additional barriers. So animals can see many, many things and sense certain things, know certain things that we can never know. So now we're going to your point. So even though it's true that the physical body cannot see that which is spiritual, we cannot see that which is a spiritual power, we can sense it, we can feel it. Why can we feel it or how is it that we can feel that which is spiritual? Because we have within us something that's spiritual too. And they speak the same <coughs> language. The neshama is spiritual. <coughs> and because the neshama is spiritual, the koach ruchani, it is able to experience something spiritual. It is able to feel or to be aware of something spiritual around it. But it would not be able to see it. And that is very fascinating. The fact that we can actually experience something spiritual that we, don't, we may not have any words for it, and we may call it something else, but there are experiences that are spiritual in nature. Why? Because the neshama within us is experiencing it, not the physical body. Yes? Oh, also, I know if you uh, put, uh, if you take ash and ground, put it in a fine powder and then put it around your bed, um, right. When you wake up, you will find chicken feet or rooster feet. Or oh yeah! If you want a recipe of how to see demons, I'll be glad to share it with you. No, <laughs> I, I don't. I actually don't want. To but see I don't them. recommend it. No. I actually don't want to yeah. see them. In fact, I heard a story about a Tana who did that and yeah. got quite freaked out. Oh, you don't have to go back so much in time. There's people who recently experienced it and they got freaked out. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, right. really in fact, even the ash thing, I'm yeah. too freaked out to try. Anyway, human language. Our human language, whether it's English or Chinese or Spanish, speaks in physical terms. We describe things in physical terms. And because we describe things in physical terms, when we learn Kabbalah, and Kabbalah speaks about spiritual, a spiritual world with spiritual uh, manifestations, with spiritual elements, it cannot be understood, cannot fully be comprehended by us, unless we ascribe to them physical terms. Otherwise, we, we cannot understand, we cannot relate to it. So if you ever learn Kabbalah, if you're really, really interested in something like that, it's very, it could be very deep, but it's very abstract, very difficult, unless, you know, your neshama is attracted to it, and unless you have a real, real interest in it, you know, one needs to always learn the basics first before he goes to the esoteric, to the mystical, to the abstract. One has to have a good foundation before he builds a big building on top of it. So the foundation is, of course, the, the basics that every Jew needs to know. Besides uh, the true fear for God, besides a, a clear emunah, a clear understanding of, of what the Torah expects of us, as Jews and so forth, and once one has the, the, the basics, 
the basic knowledge of Judaism, he can progress. He can go on and specialize if he wants in other areas, uh, whether it's halakha, that he wants to specialize, depending what his neshama is drawing to. Every neshama, every soul is drawn to something else. But even if you're drawn to Kabbalah, you have to be careful. It has, be, it has to be taught by someone who really, really knows what he's talking about. You have to be very careful. And one of the, the, the rules, or one of the warnings, I should say, in learning Kabbalah is to be very, very careful not to believe at any moment that that which you read is literal. The, the terms used to describe the various phenomena, or the various uh, sefirot, for example, the various attributes of God, is physical. There's nothing physical out there, nothing whatsoever. We're talking about a spiritual world out there. And therefore, any term that appears to be physical or that resembles something that we know is only intended for us to have an idea of how these, uh, these phenomena operate, or a better, how they interact with the world, how we interact with them. So in order to enable us to have a better understanding of how God interacts with this world, we have to use physical terms that we are familiar with. But they are not at all, at all, whatsoever, physical representations of anything, because there is no, there's nothing physical out there. Very important point. And that's what makes it difficult. Part of the difficulty is that we are asked to, to try to understand something that doesn't really exist. And that is why physical terms are used. Let me give you a quick example. You find sometimes the term uh, of a, a definition or a description of Hashem in using the male, a male, a male name, and sometimes a female name. For example, you have a Kadosh Baruch Hu. A Kadosh Baruch Hu, the Almighty, right? You're using the word Hu. Maybe we're using the word who is he a who maybe he's a why not a she who is him is it a he or a she we know it's not a he or a she but why are we saying Akadosh Baruch Hu? and when it comes to the Shekhinah we say Shekhinah which is female you know in the Hebrew language there is gender there is Zachar and there is Nekeva so why are we describing certain things as male or female but that too is an important idea in the Kabbalah, because these two forces that Hashem created in the world, right, left, male, female, day, night, pairs, represent different energies. Let's call them energies. One is the energy or the power of giving, and the other one is the power of receiving. That is what all creation is about. In essence, there is a giver and there is a receiver. God gives and we receive. The male gives, the female receives. And in describing a Kadosh Baruch Hu and the various other terms that we use male, what's intended here is to describe how he interacts with us, how he gives to us, how he bestows upon us his blessing, how the light from above comes down into this world, even though it becomes diminished, as the Kabbalah uses the term tzimtzum, in order that we are able to tolerate it, the tremendous light, nevertheless, it's coming down, and it's coming down for what purpose? For us to receive. There's so much that God wants to give to us. This all-loving God is all about giving. And the human being was created as a recipient, as a vessel for all that giving. Nevertheless, when we use the term Shekhinah, Shekhinah is something that we are hopefully going to have with us something that we are going to receive, something that will reside with us, something that will become internal, something that will be with us in this world, so it is a more of a feminine type of, uh, of name. But upstairs there's no male and female really, remember that? There's no real physical descriptions of anything, but in order for us to understand how these things interact with us, how, how Hashem interacts with this world, various names are given to describe his relationship with us. So in this world, man, for the most part, is a receiver. He receives. Everything he receives, he receives from, from above. 
But we are told that man's main mission is to train himself to be a giver. Through the mitzvot, that is the vehicle through which we become givers, whether it's charitable, giving, kind, and so forth. But God doesn't need our giving to him. Even though our actions are very powerful, and they definitely make a big difference in the upper worlds too, especially the Jewish nation, there's no doubt that there's connection between the two worlds, and our performance is very significant. Nevertheless, he doesn't need it. So where is the given demonstrated by the human being? The, given, the true giving aspect of the human being is demonstrated through his neshama. Since the physical body acts as a vessel to receive, the force behind the nature of the human being that is able to actually give at all is his neshama. The neshama, the captain of the ship, the neshama is the one that makes the decisions. The neshama is the essence of the human being. And because the neshama is spiritual, and the neshama is a chelek eloka mima, part of the divine, of the, uh, it's the divine part of God, it has a similar nature. Adamele elion, the pasuk says, I want to resemble my God. In what way can you resemble him? By the act of giving. So the act of giving, the ability of man, man's ability to give, comes from his neshama. He can make the decision not to be, not to be selfish, but to be giving. It's completely up to him. He makes that decision. And basically, our major decisions in our life will involve the giving. Even though we're always receiving, that is going to be a major part of our decision making. So what do we see so far? That the physical body that we have is the one that's really limited. A physical body is limited in many, many ways. We cannot fly like a bird. We cannot run like a cheetah. Right? We have our l physical limitations. The body decomposes after a while. It doesn't last forever. You can get easily sick. We are dependent on food and drink. The, all these limitations. The neshama, however, is that part of us that is not limited. Coming from above, even though it does have certain limitations for what Hashem created it for, but in some ways it's really not limited. At least not limited by the forces of, of nature, the physical laws of nature. And therefore, any neshama has the, the ability to, to be a tremendous individual to accomplish a great deal, as long as Hashem, as long as Hashem of course, allows for it, as long as it's within the mission of what it needs to accomplish, but it's pretty much unlimited. The physical body has limitations. You cannot make as much money as you want, because what's limiting you is your mazal. Mazal is a set of rules that limits an individual scope of what he as a physical human being can accomplish in this world, how long he can live, even if he eats a good diet. The best diet in the world does not smoke. He's skinny, right? How many people have you, have you known or heard of that were skinny, healthy, exercised, and died of a heart attack at the age of 54, 55? Mm -hmm. Many. Because of the genes, that's what they say. It's really all mazal. It's all minashamayim. It has nothing to do with what they ate. Here, you have proof. You have people that smoked for every day of their life. Even when they were 10 years old, they started smoking. Right? Every day. And they lived to 100. Right? What, what about, happened? What about people, they said, uh, money is a set of mind. And you can change your, if you are the right set of mind, you can make money as much as you want. No, that's not true. Time. There's no such a thing. Um, Jewish philosophy is very, very clear. Jewish Ashkafat perspective is very, very clear that one's parnasa, livelihood, is dictated from above. Now, if you're going to be lazy and, and sit at home and, uh, and do nothing, then of course that's your free will that's preventing you from doing what you can otherwise do. But you can work day and night. You can take three jobs, and you're not going to make one penny more than Hashem said you will. You understand? No, but every course is for set of mind that people make more money. No, it's not true. It, it, if you have a, a positive state of mind, then you'll feel better about yourself. You can accomplish more. You will be more productive in your work. You see what I mean? Yeah. And if you're sad and depressed, you may get fired if you're working for someone who doesn't, right? So obviously you have to watch yourself. You don't want, a person can commit suicide too by eating junk food every single day. That's not decided from above. So if he, if he feels bad, he's not happy with himself, he has a bad attitude, 
and he's going to wake up late every morning, right? Not be productive, not do anything because of all the thoughts that are in his or her mind. He's going to basically ruin the day for himself. That was not decided from above. That he or she decided how, what kind of a day they were going to have. You can decide. That's what's a good idea to listen to music and uh, maybe eat a little bit of chocolate yeah, <laughs> or have some coffee. Whatever it is to stimulate a little bit. The physical body needs stimulation. A little bit of wine sometimes. Not when you're, not when you're driving, however. <laughs> right? right? All these things help. Help. Because we're, the physical body needs it. Yeah. <coughs> Some people, you know, have uh, certain preferences in food, of course, or other things. And if, and if they get what they like, and it could be even ice cream, right? All of a sudden, they feel better. <laughs> so, the result yeah. goes also for marriage and, and children as well. Yeah. Mazal, we spoke a lot about Mazalot, many, many lectures given on Mazalot. Everything in this world is decided by the Mazal except for your free will in the area of whether you're going to be a righteous man or a wicked man. Whether you're going to be nice or not nice, giving or not giving. Uh, there are other little things that you decide, whether you're going to catch a cold or not, you're going to get an upset stomach too. That may be your fault too. But otherwise, a kol bidei shalayim, everything is in the hands of heaven. We don't have a choice in the matter. If somebody, you go out the street and somebody insults you, that's minah shalayim. You were meant to hear that insult. Right? Now, how you react to that insult, that's up to you. You, you follow me? Yes. Yes, but uh, sure, everything is from shalayim, but... Right. Uh, except for yirat shalayim, not everything. Uh, everything except for yirat shalayim, the fear of heaven. Uh, well, except that... You know, the Torah says that it is a mitzvah to take care of the body. That's right. That's what I just finished saying. But a person can, can commit suicide by himself by not eating right if he doesn't take care of this body. That's another small area. That, that's not a big area. I'm talking, the big areas are marriage, children, and parnasah. Most people do not destroy their body. Most people live normal, they eat normal, more or less. So they will live according to their mazal, whether it's 75 years, 80 years, and a lot of the age will have to do a little bit with the genes of the parents, plus the mazal, and where you live geographically. So I'm talk those, those are normal things, small things. The big things, like children, what kind of children? How many children? Boys or girls? Uh, what kind of a job? What kind of a career? Where are you going to live? What house are you going to buy? How much money are you going to earn? What, eh, how long you you know was even how long you're going to live? All these things are really are dictated from above. These things have nothing to do, for the most part, with your choice. You think you're making a choice, but you're not. When you buy a car, you think you made the decision. Your mazal pushed you to buy this car. You know, was there are things that you may be making the choice, but if that choice is going to interfere with your mazal, with your life, they won't let you make that choice. If you always take the 101 and for some reason today you, take, you took the 405, that was Minash Shamayim. You did not make the decision. So people have a hard time with this because they really think that they have so much control, but they don't. We don't have any control over many of these areas in our life. It's all part of our mazal, all part of Hashem's plan for us. But anyway, that's a different topic. The physical body is therefore limited, the neshama is not. In Abraham Avinu, upon learning that Hashem created the world, Hashem exists, Hashem is involved in everything, learned more and more about Hashem's nature, little by little. For example, at one point, he realized that Hashem is not only the creator of the world, He can actually make changes to the world that He made. As the Midrash tells us, Abraham was an astrologer. And he knew his mazal. According to his mazal, he, he, he will not have any children. So Hashem has a conversation with him. Abraham, what are you so sad about? God, what do you mean, sad? I have what to be sad. You promised me all kinds of things, but what good is all those promises and all those riches if I don't have a child? And the one that's going to inherit me is my servant. Ah, Abraham, Hashem tells him, it's not going to be your servant, it's going to be a child that's going to come from you. How's that? I'm not supposed to have children. It says, who created the stars? Well, you. Well, you know what? I have some news to tell you. I can change the mazal too. So, Abraham Avinu that day learned a new lesson. 
It's not God not only created the world, not only is in charge, not only interacts, not only knows and reads our mind and knows everything. He can also, if he chooses to, change the mazal. How did he do that? He added a letter to Avram's name. Avram doesn't have children, but Avraham will have. Sarai does not have children, but Sarai will have. And that is why we sometimes add names when somebody is very sick. We want to strengthen his mazal or change his mazal. <coughs> when we pray to Hashem, what do we pray for? If everything is set in stone, that's the way it's going to be. Because our relationship with Hashem says that we're special. We're his children. We can change the mazal by asking him, by beseeching him, by praying to him, by fasting, by, being, by giving charity. We can cancel bad decrees. We have that ability to make changes by speaking to him. And sometimes those changes occur in miraculous ways. You mean God makes miracles? Yes. The Jewish people had to learn that for 40 years when they saw man coming down, the Red Sea splitting. Wow. They thought in Egypt God is only knows how to hit, how to punish. After all, he, he, he hit the Egyptians 10 times. Blood, frogs, lice. Imagine if you had all those 10 things happening today. <laughs> What would you think of this God? This God is a punishing God. That's all he does, is punish. So what does God prove to them in the desert? I don't only punish, I'm good. For the most part, I'm very, very good and generous and kind and compassionate. I gave them water to drink in the desert, protected them with, with the clouds, right? They have continuous air condition, you know, perfect climate as they were in the desert. No scorpion bites, no snake bites. Everything was very pleasant and very nice. Until they complained, of course, then they got hit over their head. But otherwise, what is all this 40 years for? It's a school to teach them lessons, all kinds of important, valuable lessons of who this God is, how he interacts with the world, what he expects of us. But we still don't understand him fully. Well, so what? What do you expect to figure out everything in 70, 80 years that you're going to stick around? My favorite is what Hashem told the Yov. Yov. Did you see my blueprint when I created the world? Where were you when I created the world? He tells Yov, you know, Yov had all these questions. I can't understand, I can't figure this out. Why so much pain and so much suffering? Why? So you expect to understand everything? Where were you when I created the world? Did you see my blueprint? Nobody has seen his blueprint. When we go upstairs, we understand a little bit better than what we understand while we're alive. But during the 70, 80 years, you expect to know everything? <laughs> As Shlomo Melech points out, even if we live a thousand years, there's going to be a drop in the bucket where we're going to, what we're going to learn about the creation. Just in the past 10 years, they've discovered 1,200 new species in the Amazon. Species and plants. 1,200 in 10 years. They didn't know existed. All kinds of new frogs and lizards and monkeys, all kinds of things, plants. They didn't know they existed. Imagine, we haven't seen everything in this physical world we're expecting to understand God's ways too. I mean, we just don't have the time, we don't have the ability, it's impossible. So that was one of the lessons to Abraham. Abraham Avinu learned various lessons as he was getting older. In every stage of his life, he knew a little bit more about this God. And what is his conclusion? That Hashem has no limitations whatsoever, He knows everything and He is capable of everything. In the English language, they use a Latin term to describe Hashem is capable of everything, a kol yachol, as omnipotent. Did I pronounce that correctly? Omnipotent? Omnipotent, that He's capable of everything. He has the power to do anything. Besides omnipotent, there's also omniscient. I think I pronounced that right. Omniscient means He knows all. Omnipresent, he's everywhere. Male kevodo. And some even add omnibenevolent. In other words, he's all good. He's the tachlita tov. There's nothing bad in him. Because we pee elyon lot ot. From him, nothing bad comes down. We bring about the bad. And anything that appears to us as bad is really kapara anyway, an atonement. So there's nothing really bad. So this is a tremendous description of this tremendous koach that we have of course, that we're, we're with, that we can never fully comprehend, but just a little bit. This is all an introduction, all of this that we just covered, to understand the principle that we're covering tonight, that Hashem does not have a body. And this is a very imp important principle in our faith, that Hashem does not have any physical 
attributes, in other words, not, nothing physical about him. Nothing therefore resembles him. And no, none of the rules of the physical world apply to him. That's a very important idea. It's so important that the Torah makes sure to stress it. That after we heard the voice of Hashem in Matan Torah and Kabbalah Torah, be careful, Moshe reminds us, you did not see kol temuna. Remember, what are you going to teach your children? You did not see any image. Lota selecha kol pesel, another commandment. Don't make yourself any images. Don't try to reproduce. Don't try to imagine. Nothing. All of this, if God forbid you ever do to yourself, if you ever fall into this trap like the rest of the nations did, it's going to dilute. It's going to weaken your connection to me. You're going to, you're going to forget about me. So be very, very careful. There's no images. There's no nothing. There's only one. You heard him. You, you were witnessing it. You experienced it. You weren't told the story by some guy who saw some, a vision in a dream. You actually were there. So don't try to figure what this koach looks like because you didn't see anything that you can actually represent him in physical terms. And that is why it's very, very strict prohibition against creating idols of any form or even painting, painting any images of the celestial bodies. So you cannot make any of the celestial bodies. You cannot have a complete image of a human being as a statue. No human being and no celestial bodies. Animals is not a problem. Fish, animals. The problem is a man, right? And any of the celestial bodies, the moon and the sun. Even if you're drawing, it cannot be exactly look like the sun. You know, with crayons, usually the, the sun doesn't really look like the sun. So it's not... Why are you not allowed to draw a person? A complete. With, with drawing a person, you cannot really completely draw him. That's why some, some big rabbis were even against taking a picture of them because of that too. Of a complete image. Now, to have a complete image of man, it would be a, a sculpture, something sculpted. Right? A pesel. So if you got a... If you got... Somebody gave you a gift or a souvenir or something you brought yourself from some... Uh, uh, Far East country, Thailand, where they have all these little statues, and you like it, it's very nice, it's a little, uh, you know, looks like a doll, it's beautiful, you know, you have, you have to chop off the nose, <laughs> or chop off a finger, yeah, if you want to keep it, it has to be incomplete, no image, no perfect image of a human being is allowed in Judaism, you cannot possess it, and you, can, you cannot make it, you cannot be involved with any kinds of images of human beings or of the celestial bodies. What is the reason? Because the Torah says you're going to you're going to get confused by by these things, and it's going to eventually lead you to worship them. Yes. Um, but uh, what about a little boy having, let's say, an action figure or something? A what? An action figure, let's What's say, that? a little boy or a, a little girl having a doll. The dolls usually, most dolls are not complete. They're not, they don't. Their fingers are not necessarily apart. They don't perfectly resemble a real figure. But some okay. dolls can be, possibly, and therefore you would have to make it incomplete. Yeah. That's the halakha. So Hashem has none of the yesodot, none of the four elements, even though all matter consists of the elements, the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water. Since Hashem is not physical, he's not, he's not, he does not consist of any of the elements. Well, if that's the case, then you should understand right now, after my introduction, why the Torah sometimes depicts Hashem with physical terms. Yad Hashem, bizra'a netuya, with an outstretched arm. Hashem's hand. Hashem kigibor say like a straw man. <coughs> These are all physical descriptions, physical terms. But what did we say in the introduction? This is all intended for lesaber ozen. It's only for us to become a little bit more uh, familiar with Hashem's perulot, Hashem's actions with us, in terms that we can understand. An outstretched arm, that I mean is that Hashem took us out from the deepest of, of, the, of, 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 of misery, in the most difficult situation, all the way from above, in miraculous way. That's some, some, some sort of uh, understanding of what an outstretched arm could be, even though it's far, even though it's difficult, even though, you know, it's so miraculous. Hashem was capable of doing it. Hashem, of course, does it. So many of the terms used in the Torah, not just in the Kabbalah, in the Torah, to describe Hashem using physical terms like Hashem heard. Does Hashem hear? He doesn't have ears. 
Shem spoke, he doesn't have a mouth. He doesn't have vocal cords. It's a way for the human being to understand actions that we deal with, that we have in our daily life. We speak, we hear. So how does Hashem speak to us? Does He send us email? Right? Does He fax? Right? He has, an, he has His ways of speaking to us, but it's, it's a form of speech, a form of communication. And that is why the rabbis tell us, Dibra Torah B'nei Adam. The Torah spoke to us in the language of human beings. What's that? The physical language. Okay, if that's the case, that Hashem is very strict about not making an image, there are no images, then why did the Jewish people in the desert make an image? An Egen Masecha. Every time we go through Parshat Kitisa and we read about the golden calf, we're, I think most of us are a little bit surprised. You just heard Hashem speak to you. You just saw His miraculous uh, uh, way of taking you out of Egypt, you just experienced Hashem in many, many ways, in an incredible way. Well, what's this Egel Masecha? What is this golden calf all about? And He warned you not to make such things in the Ten Commandments. You heard it. It's very important to keep in mind several ideas when learning Parshat Kitisa Batege. First of all, it was not the Jewish nation. It was the Erev Rav, the multitudes that joined us out of Egypt. Coming out of Egypt, many nations joined the Jewish people. All the Jews are leaving, let's become Jewish. Let's join them. Let's jump, join, let's jump on the bandwagon, right? Let's be like them. Great. Hashem said to Moshe, I don't recommend you accepting them. But He said, let's give them a chance. And they gave us more trouble than anybody else throughout our history. Individuals whose neshama, whose soul, is not completely pure and divine, I mean, the, the soul is divine, but what, I'm talk, what I mean it's not completely divine is that they're not as divine as the Jewish soul. And therefore, they're, they're not as attached to that which is divine and Jewish. And you have many, many Jews who are not interested because of that in Judaism. I'm not talking about the ones who are ignorant. The ones who drift, they could be from the Erev Rav, the one that causes troubles, the ones that don't have a love for Israel and their brethren can be from Erev Rav. These are admixtures in the Jewish nation today that don't really belong. And unfortunately, we have to deal with them because the, biologically they're Jewish even though they don't behave like them. So these individuals, because of their experience with witchcraft, because of their experience with Avodah Zarah, idol worshipping in Egypt, because of their knowledge, they were still fresh. So it came to them a second nature to, to become exposed and to get involved once again, especially since Moshe was gone for so long. And they thought maybe he's gone forever. They had this mistake. They made a mistake. They really thought for a moment that he may not come back. And what did they want to accomplish? They knew Hashem exists. So what did they want to do? They wanted to bring down this Koach Elyon, this tremendous power that exists upstairs, that was channeled through Moshe in some way. Moshe was the leader. Even though he was not, he's not a God. I mean, God is God. But Moshe was a leader through which Hashem communicated and he is the one that led us. So they wanted this koach to be channeled here in this physical world through something physical that they can relate to you know, and worship. So their kavana, their intention was not just to believe at that moment at least that God has an image. What they created was not an image of God. Not whatsoever. That was never their intention. But they wanted to introduce or to bring about to bring down this Koach Elyon, this, this, this divine power, into this physical world so that it could lead them on their way, on their journey, the continuation after, since Moshe is gone. Nevertheless, it was a big sin. It was a big sin to represent the power of God in any way in physical terms. And as you will see soon, this is the problem that led many, many nations, many cultures, many civilizations away from God by beginning to worship all these powers in, in a physical way, when you're not supposed to. It, it takes you away from God, plus it introduces Tum'ah. It introduces an incredible amount of impurity. Because once you move into that world, the world of, of idols, the world of all sorts of powers that exist, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get all powers com confused. There are evil powers out there. Tum'ah, impurity, witchcraft, black magic. 
all of this stuff is in some ways competing with the pure forces, the pure powers. Hashem created Zelu Matze, both positive and negatives. Why? To allow for free will. If Hashem would make the, all the positive and beautiful and holy very, very strong, too strong, nobody would go there. All the customers would become Jewish. Everybody would, would do the right thing. Everybody would be almost like a robot. Hashem makes it equally strong. He conceals himself. Does might not, not, not make things too apparent and obvious so people can choose properly. <coughs> but it's very tempting. You know, there's a lot of temptations in the other side. And there's a lot of impurity because it's impure forces. And so people who fell into that trap not only were becoming distant from God, they become actually impure. And when a person gets involved in impurities, he's, he's stuck. It's very hard to remove him. Anybody that lives with a non-Jewish girl, for example, or a Jewish girl living with a non-Jewish boy, she, and they become very intimately involved, attached, it's going to be very difficult to, sp to break them up. The impure powers imprison. You know, it's like they hold on very tightly like a bulldog to that which is holy. Because they, they want it for themselves. That which is holy is attractive to the impure. And unfortunately, to the pure, that which is impure is not attractive, but it's tempting. And, you know, that, that's where things can go very, very wrong if you, people get involved in, in, the, in the other side. So the Torah has to warn us, stay away from that and anything that can lead you to that. And what's going to lead you to that? Images, idols, demonology, getting involved with demons. Yeah, people used to contact demons. People used, all kinds of people, civilizations, were involved with demons. Exians? What is that? Exians? No, science is not demons, that's spirits spirits and souls. But what happens is there's a lot of a lot of incredible things in this world that older civilizations were able to do until this very day scientists cannot figure out how they were able to pick up such large rocks and make such big temples. It could be they used all kinds of spirits, all kinds of demons, all kinds of witchcraft to accomplish that. Because back then they had tremendous access to these kohot, to these impure forces. And they were giants also, once upon a time. So there are various ways that they were able to accomplish that, other than mechanical ways on their own. They were supernatural ways. But unfortunately, for Jews, some Jews got caught up into that too. Because it was tempting, it was interesting. So the Egel, unfortunately, was a big mistake, the, the golden calf. But it came about as a result of all kinds of wrong beliefs that the Erev Rav had at the time. The Jews were punished too later on because they did not protest. Our punishment as a nation for the Erev Rav's action is because mainly we did not protest. If you don't protest something that is wrong, then you are basically guilty of uh, going along with it. What, what's the big idol today? Dollars, euros. Right? Yen, yeah. money, <laughs> mula, right? The money, money has become an idol because people worship it. People put so much trust in it. They think that's going to bring them happiness. That's, they think that's what's going to protect and save them. So it has the same effect of what? Of distancing the Jew or any human being actually from God by believing that this is his God. By believing that this is what will give him happiness. This is what will make him happy. But it's not so. But it's a tremendous power. It's, a tr it's very, very tempting. And the, the Torah tells us anybody that g falls into this trap, if the Jewish nation ever becomes very comfortable, they will become rebellious. They will turn against God. They will become rich. Then they will move away. They will not believe anymore that there is a God that takes care of them, that provides for them. They'll think money does it. Money does it. So money has the same power in many, many ways as, as the golden calf or as the idols of the past. And what's, what do the idols do? I mean, the idols, the essence of idols is a representation. It's bringing down those powers that they knew exist down into this world. They believe that this is the way to worship them. Each one had different ideas of how to worship them. And they started making temples and representations and images and bringing them food and doing all kinds of things because this is what each one believed was a way to get close to that power which is so far removed from them. 
But if we bring him down here, we make something for them, this is like our, our telephone line to that power. This is our connection. But this is so not true. So the Torah has to warn us about things, not because they're false, because they're real. But don't get carried away by it, by believing that, because the, 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 in reality, compared to God, they're nothing, because He's responsible for everything. But He created, God created in the world various kohot, including nature. Rain and all that, it's part of the rules of nature that Hashem created. But it's all from Him. So since the Goyim had this connection with demons and had this connection with spirits and with Tumah, they were able to do all kinds of incredible things and that is why they actually continue to believe till this very day, even though today it's mostly tradition. It's not like it used to be in the past. It wasn't, it's not, today you don't see heavy-duty witchcraft, but in some places you still do. In some places of South America you still have it. So the Torah warns us many, many times Stay away from their superstitious beliefs, stay away from their activities, stay away from all kinds of things that can lead you away from, uh, from me. And that is why when, when Hashem tells Moshe, go down to your people, Saru Maher, they've moved away so quickly from me. Why do you mean quickly? Because anytime somebody gets involved in idol worshipping or goes to the Tum'ah, it just sweeps them away very, very quickly. For one to be, go from orthodox to not religious, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it's a gradual <coughs> weakening of his faith and attachment. But if a person gets involved in Tuma, in impurity, in pure forces, he moves away very, very quickly. It takes him away very, very fast. And because of the dangers of Tuma and the like, there's a prohibition of entering a church, even if you're not worshiping. You can't go into a church. You can, you may go into a mosque, a Muslim mosque, because that's not Abu Dazara, in the same way as the Christianity can be. And I say can be because it depends on the, the various forms of Christianity. Some are, are more of a problem than the others. Those who believe in the Trinity are more of a problem. Those who have images are more of a problem. But still, the prohibition is still the same. We are not allowed to enter a, a church. There's two problems with it. There's Marit Ain, what people will think. Oh, it goes to church. You know, rumors spread very quickly. People think all kinds of things. People's imagination runs wild. So you, you have to be careful where you go and what you do so people should not speak bad about you or learn from you that it's okay. Plus, number two, when you go into a church, you're identifying with it. You're giving it a form of respect, which you cannot do. Why can't you? Can't you still be a nice Jew and do this? No, this is going to take you away. This has a tremendous magnet to take you away, to draw you away. <coughs> if it's a trip and you're, let's say, visiting a, a foreign country and you're <coughs> to... No. There's even a pasuk that we say when you walk by a church. Okay, a pasuk about, you know, you know, uh, of uh, basically reminding yourself to, be, to, be, to stay away from something that is despised. So, all of this for what? to impress upon us how dangerous this is, how, how impure this is, how this is against what we are supposed to be uh, talking about, or learning about, or, or disseminating our, you know, our teachings. This goes against, this is contrary to everything. This is therefore poison. Do you want to ask something? Are you allowed to go into a reform conservative show? Also not. Yeah. Same reason. You're not, even you, allowed you, to enter. you're not allowed to enter a reformed temple where if, if it's where they pray. Oh, that's what? If it's the place where they pray. But if it's the hall where they're having a banquet or bar mitzvah or something, it's not a problem. But the place where they pray, you cannot be seen entering it as so, oh, this is okay. That's the problem. See, it's not like a church, of course. But it's, it's prohibited in the halakha because you're identifying with it and people may think it's okay. You don't want to show any, in any way that you have respect for this, that you approve of this. So therefore, anything that has to do with tum'ah, anything that has to do with images, uh, forbidden images, statutes and the like, one has to be very careful not to give any form of kavod, and therefore not to have it in your home, you have a maid, you want to bring her a gift from Israel, don't bring her a little cross. <laughs> <laughs> bring her a Magen David, but don't bring her a cross. Even though the cross is just a little nothing, 
some people still worship it and kiss it and right so it's Avodah Zarah or it's a form of Avodah Zarah yeah. you're beginning to see how the Torah was very careful now don't think only the Torah was very careful the rabbis too throughout the history were given the authority to enact all kinds of laws and rules to make sure that the Jew doesn't stray too far you have Yain Nesech or Stam Yinayin, for example wine that is made by a Goy or even touched by a Goy Jewish one that's touched by a Goy if the bottle is open and it's not cooked not pasteurized you can't drink it that's it no good what? what? what's going on here? there's two types of prohibitions here there's the prohibition of Yain true Yain Nesech which was used or was planned to be used on the altar of the, of the idol so it's, it's like Avodah Zarah, it's like part of the idol worship activities and uh, belongings and things that go along with it. So that's Tameh, that, and that's Asur, that's part of the Avodah Zarah. Lo yidbak beyadcha meumah, the Torah says you cannot have anything to do with it, not even a small souvenir from it. Unless it's completely broken, destroyed, and, and, and thrown in the garbage, and it has no value. So the wine that in those days they used to pour in the altar, or, or, or was planning to, the thought was to give it to, the, to, to that service is just like Avodah Zarah itself, like idol worshipping. Today that we don't always have that, it's called Stam Yinam, the regular plain wine that's made by God. What is it? It's grape juice. Right? You can have pomegranate juice that's made by a Goy, squeezes it, didn't put anything else in there, no other non-kosher ingredient. Why can't I have a, a, a wine? It's not pork. No idols, no nothing, no church, no nothing. Regular California uh, whatever it's called, uh, California f Cabernet uh, Sauvignon, <laughs> whatever, yeah, right? Wine. What's wrong with that? It's made by Goim. The rabbis were very, very careful that we should not get too close to the Goim, too close for comfort, because we may come to assimilate and intermarry with them. Wine is those things. One of the things that brings us close. Same thing with a Goy cannot cook for you. If you have somebody cooking for you, somebody non-Jewish, you either have to turn on the flame for Ashkenazi people, or you at least have to put the pot on the fire. You have to be involved to show that there's some distance here. You know, we're different. I, you can't let you do all the cooking, depending what it is. If it's a cup of coffee, it's okay. There are certain halachot as to what a goy can prepare for you and what they cannot. But definitely not a whole meal, right? Definitely not meat and certain things that are... Uh, special foods, right? You, unless you're involved. If you're involved, it's okay. Why? Just to keep this distance. We cannot get married. We cannot get too close. This, this could be nice. We can be friends to each other. We can work with each other. We can't get married. So in order to maintain this distance, there's certain takanot. The rabbis gave us certain rules on how to maintain this. And one of them is not to drink their wine or not even to drink wine that they touched, that we made if the bottle was open. They touched it, as long as the wine was not pasteurized. Because if the wine is pasteurized, the rabbis tell us this would never be used on the altar. Eh, pasteurized wine is, is too sweet, it's not as strong, it's not as good. So therefore the, the, the ruling did not apply to pasteurized wine. So these are all, rule, all kinds of rules to make sure that we stay far from them. This, is, this area of Avodah Zarah has been always a problem for us, especially during the time when there was a Yetzer of Avodah Zarah, there was an inclination up until the Second Temple was built. Once the Second Temple was built, the rabbis, of course, prayed. Our tradition tells us to get rid of this Yetzer, this inclination that drew, drew people towards it. But even though we don't have the Yetzer, we still have a problem, because ever since the Egel Azahav, we, are, we still feel, we still experience part of the punishment of the golden calf in every generation. The reason for that is because every generation still has some attachment to other gods, even though they may not be idols. As I said, they may, it may be money or be any, maybe other forms of impurities that attract the Jew, that cause him to become distant. And because of that, we're still guilty of the involvement that we had in the past with the Egel Azahab, even though it's so many years ago. Hashem scattered over all the generations the punishment, so we should not God forbid, suffer too much in one generation. But the real reason behind it is because every generation still has that weakness of moving away, moving away, moving away. And that's Hashem's way of bringing us back. 
by reminding us that we cannot be independent, that we cannot put our trust in anything else, not even in Uncle Sam. No trust in anything but in him. So what are we supposed to believe? This is a God that we cannot see. We, can, we have experienced him. We've, we've observed his actions, observed we've, we've had throughout our history. But what are we supposed to believe? Basically, it's very simple. There was once a, a, a king, I think, that asked a big rabbi, show me your God. I don't understand why you can't show me your God. I'll show you my God, he says. Show me your God. So the rabbi took him outside. I'm going to show you my God. The rabbi takes this king outside, and he was beautiful sunny day. He says, look up. There's, there's our God. And he, of course, he couldn't stare directly in the sun. He says, I can't. He says, you see? You cannot even look at one of his small little servants. The sun is one small little mishamish of Hashem. Not even a small little servant can you look at for more than a split second. You expect to be able to see the All God Almighty? You cannot. While we are alive in this physical form, physical body, the human being is not capable of seeing Him. It's just, we're not capable, even if there was something to see. There's, first of all, there's nothing to see. And besides that, we can't. When can we begin to see a little bit? When a person begins to depart from this world, even people who have had near-death experiences have said we've seen this bright light, mm -hmm. a light that does not, we cannot even describe in any terms, nothing like it in this world, all loving, warm, incredible. And, and we were drawn to it. They say that this may be the Shekhinah. And the rabbis do tell us that that is, that is something that we can see when we leave this world. While we're alive, we cannot see anything that has to do with Hashem because there's nothing to see. But the Shekhinah can be experienced, of course. The Shekhinah can be experienced that we can feel it, that it's with us. And as soon as a person leaves this world, he can actually begin to see something. Now, before he actually dies, anybody that was at anybody's deathbed, if the individual was not in a coma and he was fully awake, many, many times they would tell you within a few minutes, a couple hours, or maybe even a day before their death, oh, I see my parents, I see my grandparents coming to greet me. Many people, Jews and non-Jews. There was even an article now in the CNN, I think it was. CNN, a guy, he happens to be Jewish probably, his last name is Kessler, right? We wrote a whole article because he worked either in old age homes or convalescent hospitals, places where people die all the time, and he was documenting what people said right before they died. So all these people all of a sudden are saying, or many of them are saying, oh, my wife, is, you know, his wife passed away before him. My wife is coming to greet me. Oh, I thought I would never see her again. You know, it made them actually feel good. Or big tzaddikim were able to see their rabbis, their teachers. The, the Gemara has many such stories. But here we have Goyim saying the same thing. And for the first time, CNN, documented by a guy who's not religious at least, saying, I've heard this many, many times. Right before they die, and many of them, of course, see the angel of death. Some of them know it's him. Some of them are not sure. And there's, there's descriptions of that too. My grandmother, Alea Shalom, just a few minutes before she passed away, she told one of her daughters, I'm sorry, I need to go, I already see him. What's that? Everybody's saying this exact same thing or similar thing. That tells you that they actually see something. So from, from this we, we understand what the rabbis meant. We are given permission to see at the time of death things that we were not able, were not given permission to see while we were alive. At times, however, at times we do see apparitions. We do see ghosts, as I said in the very, very beginning. There have been individuals who have seen people who have passed away as though they were in real life. What are you doing here? This is similar to what Abraham Avinu saw when he saw the three angels coming. He thought they were human beings. So the Zohar, the Kabbalah, explains that when a malach, an angel, or a spirit comes down for whatever reason, they are dressed up with a very thin type of, of garment that, uh, that, that is not completely physical, but it's enough physical so that we can see it with our physical eyes. There's, they're not physical, flesh and bones, right? By, by the way, if you ever meet Eliyahu and Avi, and you're lucky enough to shake his hand, which very few people have that merit, you probably will feel something like flesh and bones, I assume. So, I don't know how, you know, I'm sure he knows how to do that, right? But he does appear from time to time to those who are lucky, to those who have merited to see him, 
uh, and to shake his hand, whether they knew it was him or not, that's a different story. But they can see him, they can experience him. So there are times when the soul, or actually I should say the human being, is able with his physical eyes to sometimes see but uh, th these uh, spiritual entities, but most of the time we can't. At home sometimes you may be sitting in the living room and all of a sudden you say, ah, what did that thing, what was that that just went by? I'm sure it happened to many of you. What was that? And it was not a bird or a squirrel. All right? What is it? It could be a ghost, it could be a spirit, it could be, you know, it could be. I'm not saying for sure it is, but sometimes the eye, the physical eye is able to catch a glimpse, just a glimpse, not too much, of things that are present around us that we don't see. So our emuna is based on the fact that we cannot see everything, but Hashem could see, of course, everything. HaKadosh Baruch is ro'e veno nir'ah. It's, it's an entity that can see us, that can hear us, and know everything about us, but that cannot be seen. The neshama and the malachim, because they are spiritual, the soul and the angel, because they are spiritual, in their world, they're able to see and experience more. So, now that we have a good understanding, Baruch Hashem, of how the spiritual and physical world interact a little bit, I just want to add a, a couple more points about what the Torah meant when it said that we're, gonna, we're about to create, let's create man, b'tzalmenu kidmotenu. We said that Hashem has no image. We said that we should not make any images of Him. So what is it that the Torah tells us that when Hashem is about to create man, the human being, He says, let's make him b'tzalmenu kidmotenu, in our image. Now even though tzalmenu is translated as image, it's not really image. Tzalmenu, the best word, if we are, perhaps the best word may be in our appearance. And I'll tell you why I prefer this word. There's no image upstairs. So image may not be the right word, but what is in our appearance? It's still a question. Well, in our appearance means as follows. Man is different than the animal. Hashem just created animals that walk on four or crawl. This man is going to walk on two. This man's appearance will be different than the animals. He will appear more like the angels. He will appear more like, the, like those entities in the spiritual world. Not like God. So even though he's saying that Salmeno in our appearance, in our image, Shem has none. So he's saying in the appearance or in the look-alike, more in the resemblance of that which is in the spiritual world. Why? Because man has two parts to him. He has the physical animal part of this earth, plus he has the neshama. So the two of them, the physical body plus his neshama, will have the appearance of the above world. So what that means is that when the soul departs, if you're able to see a soul, you may see a little bit of smoke drifting. When a person dies, people have saw, saw some, some vapor. But if you really were able to magnify it in the upper world, the souls resemble what they look like in this physical world. They look like but it's a spiritual body. They don't have eyeglasses, right? right? They don't look exactly the way they look here because there's nothing physical to them. The hands may not, you may not see finger by finger, but it's a very, very close resemblance to what they wore down here. So the physical body and the neshama have a resemblance of the upper worlds. So this tselem is what was designated for man. But tselem kidmuten means that the tselem, the appearance that was designated for man, which is different from the animal. He, he therefore has something of the upper world. And it's for the most part referring to the nefesh. Much more than the body. Because the nefesh, as we said before, the neshama is the essence of the human being. So... The Tzalmenu is more, more referring not necessarily to the physical body, but to, to that which has been given to him from the upper world. What about Kidmuteno? Kidmuteno, the commentaries explain that he has the ability lavinu skill. He has the ability to comprehend, to make decisions. Uh, to, uh, and that's, of course, the free will. So when Hashem says, Let's us, let us make man different than the animals, what he's really saying is not only is he going to have a neshama from the, up, from the upper worlds, not only will he look different, he will have a tremendous gift 
tremendous ability that animals don't have. They have instinct and he has free will. You see the m big difference? So the, the main definition of Betzalmeno Kibbutin doesn't have to do anything with image. It has to do with his abilities, with the difference about him. He has a neshama, he has something spiritual. He's not physical. And what do we say about spiritual? Spiritual, as opposed to physical, spiritual doesn't have the same limitations as physical. He will be limited physically, he won't be able to fly like a bird. But he will not be limited through his free will to achieve tremendous heights because of his neshama. Now we can understand a little bit also why sometimes you will see terms in the Tanakh, all kinds of terms that Hashem appears like an old man. Hashem appears like a gibor milchama, all kinds of terms. What did we say in the very, very beginning? Remember, he has no physical appearance, no image. But to the Nevi'im, to the prophets, when he did appear, when they did see a vision, when they, need to, they, when they needed to experience something and be able to see something, Hashem appeared to them in some sort of, of resemblance to something that they can relate to. You know, like a wise man, like a strong warrior, so that they can understand the relationship of this vision, of what, or the meaning behind the vision. Not that he has that, but it's a, ter it's a description of something that they need to relate to, so that they can understand a little bit what action is about to happen, what he expects of them, what is the meaning of what is happening, and so forth. There's a lot of descriptions in the Midrash of how Hashem is full of compassion. So He may appear like something that gives that impression. And that is not seen by eyes. That is niklat alidea neshama, that is absorbed or experienced by the neshama through a vision. Because there's nothing to see. So what are you seeing? You're not seeing anything. You're experiencing some vision that gives you the appearance, just like in a dream you see all kinds of things. In a vision, you can you visualize or see something that Hashem wants you to see because He is representing Himself in a certain midah, in a certain characteristics. And the same is true with miracles. Many of the miracles that Hashem performs, mit lapshim bateva, they are dressed up in nature. We say, oh, it happens. There are earthquakes. There's a fault, the San Andreas fault, which is not a miracle. I mean, it's a disaster, right? But anything that happens in a miraculous way, is many, many times dressed up in nature because that is the way Hashem conceals Himself. Hashem dresses up the spiritual power or His presence in this world through natural phenomena. Throughout the history, you can now understand a little bit why the Goyim tried their best to convert us, to have us bow down to the idol, to accept this and to accept that. What do they care? Let them mind their own business. Right? What's going on over here? But as I said earlier, the Tum'ah needs the Kedusha. The Tum'ah cannot survive without the pure forces. And their, by, by their trying to get at us, it was not just to strengthen themselves, the, the, the Tum'ah strengthening itself through the Kedusha, but it's a way of, of basically strengthening their belief in that they are right in their way. So long as the Jew is alive, practicing Judaism, this is the greatest to them, the greatest insult, the greatest, as I was saying in Yiddish, the pachim ponim, the greatest slap in the face, the greatest obstacle in their way of proving that they are right. These guys, no matter what we did to them, they're still around. They still believe in their God, no matter. All the Muslims, all the Christians, billions of people don't believe what the Jews believe. Hey, the Jews, the stubborn Jews still believe it. So this is a big problem to them. And the Vatican can't take it because it goes against all their teachings. That's why they did not want to believe in the creation of the State of Israel. According to them, it's not supposed to happen. The Jews were punished. The Jews were exiled. You see what I mean? So the impure forces out there are trying to baptize the Jew. Missionaries are being sent all over the world to get the Jew more than anybody else. This is the one we have to get. Because if they're able to weaken the Jew, if they're able to make him baptize, bow down to the idol, this will take him away. This will take him away. And they do it with money and with all kinds of ways to, you know, they're nice, they appear to be nice, they're not nice at all. Right? They will use, many times they will use force, even if they're not Muslims. Throughout our history, get them to, 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 to convert, because they know that once they, they get them to convert, it's going to be very, very hard to go back. That is why the Maranos in Spain made a bit mistake. You cannot have the cake and eat it too, to behave like a Jew in the basement, put on tefillin in the morning, and then go to Mass in the afternoon and during the day, wear a cross on your chest. 
you're diluting your Judaism. Anytime a Jew dilutes his Judaism by giving respect to another religion, by, by, by taking all the symbols, and worse, by actually converting, even if he himself is still Jewish, the children, the grandchildren will be completely gone and disappear. You see why the, the, the Torah and the rabbis were very, very careful for us not to have anything to do with them, not to show them any respect whatsoever, to, to understand that this is a red line that we cannot cross. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to, to get out of it, to come out of this trap. I want to finish with a story, an incredible story, that many of you may have read during uh, Rosh Hashanah. The story of Rab Amnon Magensa. I think the, there was a similar story with another big rabbi, but this story happened with him. Great rabbi, tremendous tzaddik, close to the king, an advisor to the king, good relationships with the king for many, many years. But throughout their relationship, the king always tried to convert him. Always tried to convert him, had discussions with him, philosophical discussions. Of course, the rabbi never agreed, never thought of it, never wanted it, of course. It was never, never a question asked. Uh, Never, never entertained anything like close to, to becoming close to Christianity. But once, it was once that it, was one, it happened that the king somehow had a conversation with the rabbi and really, really pressured him. Really, really pressured him that he has to come and, and, and see and do and become. Uh, and the rabbi didn't know how to get out of him and he said, you know what, give me time to think about it. Now, it's very hard to understand why the rabbi said that. I'm only going to assume that the rabbi said that because perhaps he just wanted to get rid of the king and to think of some response, which he didn't have at the moment. That's the, I think what he was. But he, he realized when he came home that he made a big mistake. He asked for three days to think about it. He said, I'm going to think about becoming a Christian. I'm going to give the impression to the king that I'm, I'm considering it. I'm not going even if it means putting me to death. And they came to pick him up after three days. He says, I'm not going. The king, of course, was insulted, sent after him. And he told the king, listen, the tongue that gave you the impression that, uh, that I would consider it, you can cut off. The king says, I'm not going to really cut off your tongue. I'm going to also going to cut off the feet that did not come to me, cut off the hands that did not do as I said. And... Uh, all the limbs were amputated, were put into a box, and that Rosh Hashanah, he asked to be carried, of course, to the shul, and he composed one of the most beautiful, incredible, and holy prayers of the entire year, called on the Tanet Tokif. If you ever have a chance to read it, and to, in, in, your, in the language you understand, that prayer, it's incredible. It's an incredible prayer. He composed it, and after he finished composing it, he passed away from all the pain. He came to a dream to one of his students, and he says, please, disseminate this prayer all over the Jewish world, that they should pray, say this prayer, powerful prayer, on this day of Rosh Hashanah. Not all Sephardim say this prayer, even though it does appear in small letters in the Machzorim, but Ashkenazim do say it. And it's a very important part of the prayer of Rosh Hashanah. If you ever get a chance... Huh? And Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur, yeah. What's it called? Tokev. Unsane Tokev. Unsane Tokev. Kudushata Yom. Incredible, incredible, incredible prayer. But now that you know the history behind it, it's even more incredible who this man was, how he felt so terrible that he even gave the impression momentarily that he would consider it. When we... Yeah, I'm sorry to ask... Okay, go uh, ahead. Quick. Uh -huh. It's like, why God not saving for all this family? Another time I will explain it. Another time I will explain how he came to that. But obviously, as you know, Hashem is very strict with tzaddikim. The, the more righteous a person is, the more Hashem is strict and demanding and expecting of him that he should be righteous. And every little fault is, is taken care of, ideally, in this world, better than in the world to come. In order to live this world in the most purest and cleanest fashion, Hashem cleans us up here, ideally. Better it's here than up there. That would not be sufficient. Yes? Huh? How did he compose the prayer if they took out his tongue also? He, possibly he, he, he somehow was still able to speak. That's a good... That's a, 
No, it's a good question. He was possibly able still to speak. He was able possibly to compose it in writing or ask somebody or somehow. Remember, that the, main, the main composition came in the dream later. So in a dream, he told the student the words. So it could be when he was saying it, he was saying it as best as he can in his way. The real composition and message came in a dream. Just want to finish with, with what the rabbis tell us and remind every Jew that in other words, any time uh, one finds himself in trouble, any time one finds himself in a situation that he feels that it's very difficult to get out of, don't forget, in Matzol Hashem Roshia means that Hashem is all capable of doing anything in the world. If you are completely focused on Hashem, if you're completely focused on Hashem's ability to do anything, if your Emunah is pure only in Him, then you will see miracles in your life. You will see His Ashgacha. People, unfortunately, because their Emunah is not strong enough, they don't have that Bitachon, they don't have that faith in Him, they're attached to all sorts of things that they become hopeless. They, they, they begin to worry, and they begin to think it's impossible to get out of the situation. That shows that their emunah is not strong yet. It's meddled. It, it, it's, it has all, all, all sorts of impurities mixed into it. We need, to, we need to purify and strengthen our emunah from time to time. That is why I think that this series is so important, and that's why the Rambam put it together. These are things that people really should say every day. Anima amin. The anima amin, some people say it every day. Every day, say to yourself, I believe that Hashem exists, Hashem created the world, that He is one. Why? But I believe it. No, there's so many forces out there competing. There's so many things out there that are trying to weaken and take us away. By talking about it, by reading stories about the miracles, by seeing it on a daily basis, by saying it, by praying to Him with right kavanah, that Bezat Hashem will have the effect of strengthening our emunah. Thank you.